Hello, family. Welcome back to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty, and today I'm joined by Shanae. And Shanae is an evidential spiritual medium, an energy intuitive, an energy healer. And I love somebody who's really has a lot of gusto to go out there and get their story out there. Me too, me too, me too. So I love having that conscious connection with another person. You're interested in serving our community at IONS and sharing your message with the world. And so I'm going to get just toss it right over to you to start doing that. Thanks so much for your willingness to serve. Thank you, Betty. It's so wonderful to finally have gotten to meet you, although virtually, because I've been watching so many of your podcasts or watching them on YouTube, listening to podcasts and really enjoying your guests and just really resonating with your style of interviewing. So thank you so much for this opportunity. So let's see, I am not a near-death experiencer, but I have had so many different gorgeous occurrences throughout my life um, that to me, all of life is spiritual. There is this saying about like, take your meditation off of the cushion, taking your prayer out of the buildings or whatever the saying is. So for me, I try to live my life each and every day so that every day something spiritually transforms me. It could be something as simple as a beautiful flower, a gorgeous formation in the clouds, a synchronicity. What I love about being tuned into the spirit world and the spiritual realm at the same time as being tuned into the physical world is that synchronicities abound left and right when you live life that way. At least that's the way that it has worked out for me. Um, I was one of those highly sensitive children that was always told, oh, toughen up. You know, you're too sensitive. You're taking things too personally. Luckily, I didn't toughen up. Luckily, I just proceeded to open more and more and more throughout life. And that, you know, led to some hardships because you do have to be a little bit protective of your energy when you're empathic or um, spiritually intuitive. Otherwise, you can have be having a beautiful day and interact with someone. And instead of being able to uplift them, you can kind of get drawn down with them. So over the course of my many years of life, I've just learned how to attune my energy. And what's even more important than that is I always ask my spirit guides, my guardian angels, my ancestors of the light to always attune the energy around me before it even comes into my awareness so that it is in perfect harmony for what I might need in the moment um, to enliven something inside of me to say something to someone that might make their day better if they're having a, a difficult day. So for me, being tapped in and tuned in to both realms simultaneously. I feel like I'm being of service to the realm of spirit and also being of service to beings and people here in the physical world. That's very important to me. I feel like that is actually my calling, what I'm here for. Um, I am so thankful for people who are further along the path of spiritual awakening and spiritual awareness because they've been beacons of light for me. So whether that has been an interaction with someone, um, going on retreat and learning something new, reading a book, listening to a podcast. There are so many beacons of light in this world that what that does is give me light to move towards and wonderful beings to interact with and get to meet. Um, my One of my goals in life is to each and every day be a beacon of light for others as well so that others can perhaps find my light in the world and help shine theirs even brighter or just even have a better day because of interacting with me. One of the concepts that I really resonate with is that we can be presence healers. We can be healers simply by being present. Um, so back to my childhood, um, ever since I was a very young child, I've been able to perceive spirit. Uh, when I was a child, I would talk a lot in my sleep. I would move around and walk a lot in my sleep. And I realize now by looking back at that time, I was actually interacting with spirit during that time. But, you know, adults around me didn't necessarily know that that's what was going on. However, I will add that my dad is very intuitive and my mom is very intuitive and she has a clairvoyance as well as clairalliance. So she can smell spirit and um, signs coming through spirit, such as flowers and just beautiful smells like that. And she does have clairvoyance. She has a story when she was a child of her mom or her grandmother, uh, very, very sick in bed, getting up out of physically laying in bed, but her light body, her energy body, her spirit got up out of her body, walked around 
the uh, bed and then got back into her body. That did not scare my mom, even though she was a little child. Uh, my mom's dad, my grandfather, made his physical transition when my mom was um, only in her 30s. And since then, she has seen him multiple times, just dropping in to check in on her and see how she is. So I do believe that all of us can be intuitive. All of us can tap into any of these clairs, the light language, communicate with beings in spirit. But I do believe that I have a little bit easier time of it, probably because of my lineage, because this beautiful ability comes through my mom's lineage, through my, the maternal side. So I'm just so very grateful that nobody in my life ever tried to shame me for talking about um, interacting with spirits. That wasn't something that those weren't the words that I used when I was a child. But even to this day, my mom and dad, you know, they're right on board with what I do. They don't try to change me. And so I really love that. Um, but one of the first times I actually saw spirit when I was a child, I woke up. I was probably elementary school aged and my bedroom door was open. And I was thinking, Who, who's that man standing in my doorway? And why is he wearing a zoot suit? I don't even know if you're familiar with what a zoot suit looks like, but it's from like the 1940s. That's not my time period. I, you know, I'm just a kid at this time in the 1970s or whatever it was. So I'm sitting there wondering, why is he standing there? Why is he staring at me? And then it became evident to me, oh, this is a being in spirit because I could see through him. I could see the closet door behind him. So I could see him as clear as he was in three-dimensional and in physical form, but yet I could actually see the hall closet behind him. He didn't seem to say anything or convey anything. He was just there. And then I think I probably went back to sleep and I don't even know if I told my mom about it or asked anyone about it. It, it just didn't seem out of the ordinary. It wasn't something that was a big deal. Uh, fast forward quite a few years of my life and I was living in Oregon and I was living in a home where a woman had made her transition, at, you know, an old age, so just died of something natural, made her transition in the home. When I was renting the home, I was told about that, no big deal. But I actually didn't stay living in that house for long because now I don't believe that spirits or souls get stuck anywhere. That I do, But I do believe that or what I've been shown is that just like human physical bodies shed skin cells, you know, every day that we're alive, um, our, our light bodies, our energy bodies can shed photons or particles of light or residual sort of energy packets and memories. So I don't believe that her soul was stuck there, but I do believe that there was just a part of her energy essence that was there. Now, the reason why I didn't stay living there for long was because it just kept feeling too much like she was trying to get too close to me. At one point, I even felt like her energy actually flowed through me and the energy changed, the temperature changed, and I just didn't like that. And at that point, I hadn't yet gotten really good at having a really gorgeous sort of orb of light around me that only welcomes in that which resonates with me. So I ended up moving out of that home. Um, but then maybe about two or three years later, I had made so much spiritual progress and opened up so much and had come to understand the spirit realm so much more beautifully that the next experience that I had, it didn't fear me. And so what that experience was, was I was living in a very small cottage behind a main house in Berkeley, California. And um, I never liked to be in the main house after dark. It just had this sort of uncomfortable feeling there. And so one time um, the person who owned the house, he was out of town, asked me to go into the main house to get something. And I said, well, that's fine, but I don't really want to go into the kitchen after dark. And he's like, why is that? And I said, there's just an uncomfortable feeling there that I can't really explain. And he said, oh, you know, and I guess I should say trigger warning at the moment because this is going to be mentioning a death by suicide. But he said, oh, yeah, one of the previous owners many, many, many years ago had died by suicide um, in the basement of the house. And that's right below the kitchen. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. Thank you for letting me know that. So I went into the house. I got it whenever he needed to get it wherever it needed to be. And then during that time, I was studying Tibetan Buddhism. And so one of the processes that I had learned was that you can clear energy with intent and with intention. So one uh, very shortly after I learned about the death by suicide, I went down into the basement, lit an incense, and just simply walked around with love 
with light and with the intention of there is nothing for you here anymore. So once again, I don't believe that souls get stuck anywhere, but there was a residual part of this particular being's energy field or energy essence that was potentially kind of still lingering there. So I was just like, you know what? There's nothing for you here. You know, my heart goes out to you that things transpired in your physical life that then led to you choosing to die by suicide, or I don't, I don't like the word choose, but that was what happened, like death, death by suicide. And so I explained to him, you know, just be free, go into the light, wherever the rest of your soul and essence is, reintegrate with that. There's nothing for you here anymore. So then I finished the process and then maybe about, gosh, maybe within the next 24 to 48 hours, I was sleeping in my little cottage in the sleeping loft um, for those wee hours of the morning where it's that gorgeous date in between sleep and wakefulness, that luminous date. Um, I felt heaviness on my blanket. And it wasn't sleep paralysis because I could move my arms, I could lift up, I could talk, I could look around. And it took me a moment and I realized, oh, this is a part of this man's energy essence embracing me and just giving me a hug to thank me. And so out loud, I actually said, you are welcome. And even though I invited you to not be lingering in that house anymore, that didn't mean you could come linger around me. I'm not your light. I'm not where you belong. So please just go to the light, you know, go home, go to where the rest of your beautiful uh, soul is having its, its experience, be that the spirit world, heaven, whatever terminology works. And then very shortly after that, I felt the pressure lift. I felt the temperature change in the room. And then I just felt this sense of like oneness and this sense of just like release and awe. So I was very grateful to realize that I had had so much spiritual transformation take place in a short period of time. Those two events were probably only two to three years apart from each other. One of those events scared me. One of those events, I was like, oh, what am I being called to do in this situation? So I believe that that's also why I feel that if I walk through life, living my purpose, and seeing every day as an opportunity to have a spiritually transformative experience, those opportunities are around every corner. Those opportunities are everywhere. Uh, one of the things I also really resonate with, and I can't remember where I read this, there is a debate about where does the sky begin? Does it begin one inch above the ground or does it begin miles up into the sky? Like where does the sky actually begin? So for me, when I read that, I thought, oh, well, you know what? You could have that same debate about the spirit. Where does the spirit begin? Where does the spirit realm or the spirit world begin? Does it begin within us, very shortly around us, or really far away from us, way up in the heavens? And immediately the answer dropped in, it's within every cell of your body. It's not outside of you. It is within you. It is everywhere. So then everything then became even more magical and mystical to realize, oh, okay, well, yes, I am having a physical life time right now, but not only am I walking the physical world, which I need to be able to do, but I'm also simultaneously tapped into the realm of spirit. So I've come to realize that the work that I do, whether it's energy healing, whether it's mentoring others of tapping into their intuition, whether it is... Um, spirit guide readings, guardian angel readings, or evidential readings for loved ones who have loved ones in the realm of uh, spirit. It's, it's all, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> I'm realizing that it's all just, it's all so interwoven and beautiful, and it's all equally healing. Um, so I totally lost that tra train of thought, and that's okay, because what is dropping in now is just the, the realization for me. I realized years ago while I was doing the energy healing work, you know what, I am not doing this work alone. In fact, I'm not even leading these sessions. Spirit is leading these sessions. I'm in service to spirit. Okay, so now I'm back to my train of thought is that I am in service to spirit when I do this work. I don't worry about protecting myself or oh my goodness, am I gonna draw the wrong energy to me because at the essence of it all, at the core of it all, it is all spirit. We are all one. 
one of the things that I really love is distinct, but not different. I am distinct, you are distinct, we are unique, but at the core of it all, and at the highest frequency possible, we're actually all the same. And it is a beautiful tapestry of life that we are weaving together when we re recognize that. So when I do this work, I recognize that I am in service first and foremost to spirit. And then equally as important, I'm also serving the beings that I'm working with here in the physical world, the people who have trusted me to do this work with them. So I always, always, always thank the clients that find me for allowing me to do this work with them. I always do it with honesty and integrity because it's very important work to me. It's very meaningful work to me. So, so for me, that's why I just kind of keep coming back to every single day is an opportunity to be of service to spirit and I've also, I think it was Kyle Gray, um, this is man that really is uh, a wonderful angel expert. I think it's what his title used to be. Now he does uh, Kundalini and yoga and just all beautiful work in this world. And, um, oh my goodness, I keep losing my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. Well, I, I have a bunch of questions for you. So if you want, we can shift gears and maybe have a conversation about some of those. Okay, things. yeah, let's yeah. shift and whatever comes up, like, well, you'll have time to share more about okay. it towards the okay. end. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I, I really enjoyed listening to you. I, I think that, you know, it's beautiful to have this huge umbrella of mystical experiences. You know, Ian's for the last 40 years has been the leader in research around near death experiences. But over the last decade or so, we've really opened up to all mystical experiences. And this podcast, especially is for, to create space for all things spiritual. So I love yeah. hearing about, you know, your experience and how you've come into these gifts. And one of the things that came up for me while you were talking was, um, who are some of the spiritual teachers that you really resonate with? Because you were mentioning kind of like this insatiable thirst for to find these light, these light teachers for yourself. So I'd love to hear about some of the people that really resonate for you. Some of the ones that resonated with me, let's see. So I grew up, um, that terminology, unchurched. Uh, so I grew up with just the ability to find what resonates with me without anyone telling me what to believe. So for a number of years, I was learning, just reading all sorts of world religions, all sorts of spiritual traditions. And for a number of years, I was studying um, Tibetan Buddhism. So I can't recall the exact teacher's names because I went through so many different retreats. I did actually have the good fortune of attending a five-day in-person um, teaching with the Dalai Lama about the Heart Sutra. So I just really love being in that presence and around that energy. Um, another Tibetan Buddhism teacher that really resonated with me was Pema Chodron. I really loved her teaching. Um, when I found my way into more mystical Christianity sort of teachings, I found Cynthia Bourgeau. So I was actually also really fortunate to get to do uh, three five-day residential retreats with uh, Cynthia Bourgeau. Uh, I think they were like the mystical Jesus sort of teachings and talking about Mary Magdalene and just that beautiful interweaving of the divine masculine, divine feminine I've had the good fortune of being in retreat with um, James Finley, and also, he also is mythical Christianity. And oh my goodness, I oh, 10 day on um, silent Zen meditation retreat. And then over the course of time, I found my way to all sorts of people who teach about angels, who teach about spirit guides, who teach about tapping into the spirit realms. Uh, Kyle Gray was one of them. I really enjoyed his book. Uh, there's another woman, who I believe she just goes by the her, her name, Callista. I don't even know what her last name is. She teaches about the female archangels. And I'm a really big believer that none of this has gender, whether it's source or God or the great spirit or the angels, they are above and beyond gender. But when we need to personify them so that we can interact with them and feel a more intimate relationship with them, they are more than happy to be personified. If we need to see them as feminine, that comes through as feminine. If we need to see them as masculine, that's what comes through. And in fact, to, to go a little bit back into the um, spiritual side of experiences that I've had, uh, there was an experience a number of years back where I was awoken by two men standing at the feet, the foot of my bed. 
And I remember looking at them both and thinking, how did you get in here? <laughs> My front door is locked. I have no idea how you got here. I wasn't uncomfortable at all. So I immediately knew, okay, this is a spiritual experience going on here. And one man was much more upfront and one more was a little bit back by his shoulder. And the second man wasn't talking. The first man was. They were both two white men that looked like um, sheriffs from the Wild West days. They were even dressed like that. And they were just explaining to me, they were just here to protect me and keep me safe. And they just wanted to know, you know, if I had anything to say, if I had any questions. And I don't remember at that moment really having any questions. I was just thanking them for being with me and keeping me safe. And then I remember getting out of bed and walking them to my front door and I could see through them. Once again, they were the beings that I could see through and I could see my front door and I could see that, yeah, the front door is locked. You did come in through a home with a front door that's locked. How did you get in here? And then very quickly, everything shifted and I realized, oh, these are two of my guardian angels and they're just here to introduce themselves and let me know who they are and what they're doing. Now, whenever I tell people this, I never get any skepticism, but if I were to get skepticism, I would, think, I would say to them, will you know me? If I were to imagine or make up my spirit guides or my guardian angels, they would probably be these beautiful Amazonian women, right? Because I'm in this lifetime expressing as a woman. So I would probably, if I were, if I were making them up, they would not be two white men from the Wild West days dressed like sheriffs. So I think the reason why they came through that way, two reasons. One reason was because I would not forget the description of them. And the second reason would be like, oh my goodness, of course this was not a dream or my imagination. My dream world or my imagination would have created them to be something much different than that. So, so yeah, yeah I answered oh, that. Wow. I yeah. love this story. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm wondering, the first thing that came up for, for me when you said that was I was thinking about maybe somebody who's watching that would freak out if they perceived that there were two men at the foot of their bed. So I'm wondering if maybe you have any tangible tips or tools, or you can talk about your own process around how you transformed fear to faith when it comes to being exposed to spiritual signs, spiritual guides, and otherworldly experiences. For me, I think what it boils down to is, I believe, I don't even know which mystic said this, but there is nothing but God, there is only God. Now, I don't use the terminology God a lot, because for so many people, that is such a lo loaded terminology. Um, so I resonate more with the terminology of source or great spirit or all that is. But for me, that is the belief. There is only source. There is only divinity. There is only love. And so when I'm interacting with beings in the other realm and the spirit realm that are, you know, as close to me as my breath or kind of further away, if I'm seeing them clairvoyantly, not right by me, there is only love. And in all of the mediumship readings I have done, there has never, ever, ever been anyone coming through with a message where they were trying to belittle their loved one or hurt their loved one. There have been times that when they come through, they're apologizing for something that they did while they were here in their physical form. But I always assure people, the soul, the soul never, ever, ever does anything hurtful. So I believe that I am a physical being existing within the field of my soul, within the field of my spirit. And it is constantly pouring into me and out of me in a Taurus field, a toroidal field. So it's flowing in and out and in and out. And that holds me in integrity in a physical form. So when people say, oh, you know, a terrible soul or this or that, no, the soul never chooses to come here and perpetrate harm upon anyone. Our soul is always right here, flowing through us, guiding us. We are always able to tap into our soul. What I do believe is that we can get so caught up in our small human story that sometimes we can choose to do things out of greed, out of fear, out of a worry of lack, and we ignore our soul. Our soul is always guiding us through our intuition, our angels, our allies, our guides, our ancestors of the light, always guiding us to make the best choice possible the best choice that truly resonates with source, with spirit. So my soul is always right here while also simultaneously being in the realm of spirit. 
So what I try to do each and every day is just recognize everything is source, everything is God, everything is love. It might not appear that way because some people are per perpetrating great harms upon others. But I actually feel that there is more danger in this physical world than there is in the spirit realm because for me, there is no danger in the spirit realm. So if you wake up and you see beings standing at the foot of your bed, now, first and foremost, you need to discern are those beings in spirit or did someone break into your home? So obviously, you know, you've got to make the distinction there. But as long as it, it, there's always a different feeling for me, if someone were to physically walk in my room, I think this is thankful. This is um, in part because of the lizard brain, you know, because of our brain, our physical brain and our bodies. My physical brain is immediately going to alert me to the fact that's a physical being standing there. And if they don't belong here, then, you know, wake up, panic, react. But at the same time, my gorgeous soul and spirit is we have a nervous system in spirit, just like we have a nervous system in the physical form. We also have a nervous system in our physical and our um, spirit bodies that are all around our physical bodies. So that nervous system is what alerts me to the fact that that's a being in spirit. So the moment that I recognize that's a being in spirit, there is no fear. It is so very interesting. Um, if I'm walking through a room and I perceive that there is an energy being near me or a spirit near me, there is no fear. And that's what I love about this work is that I have been reminded time and time and time again, there is nothing to fear in the spirit, the spirit realm, the spirit world, heaven, whatever word you want to use, nothing to fear at all. So one of the things I like to point out to people is, first of all, discern, is that a physical opaque being in front of you? Or is that a translucent, trans spirit being in spirit, uh, translucent being in spirit? And if it's a being in spirit, nothing to fear whatsoever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, you say it and it make, you say, make it sound real simple, but I still think that, you know, even when lights flicker or something, you hear a sound or you smell something that there's no reason to be smelling it, it can be pretty fearful for people. And I think kind of integrating those spiritual gifts as your awareness opens up is like, training it's like right. being part you know it's sp spiritual fitness like building the muscles of not getting immediately scared and that like you said practicing discernment and again like practicing those spiritual principles something like discernment or mm -hmm. even intuition is something that takes practice and vigilance I'd love to talk a little bit about the fact that you grew up in a spiritual family because I feel like that's so opposite for me so I want to know everything about it but so do you think that that kind of gave you an advantage in being opened to your spiritual gifts beforehand? Do you believe in pre-birth planning? Do you think that you picked your family? Okay, so to clarify, I didn't mean to give the impression that I grew up in a spiritual family. We were unchurched. Um, and we, you know, when we were very young, I do remember saying little prayers before bedtime, pray my Lord, whatever that prayer is about, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep that one. So we grew up with the belief that yeah, there could be a God and there's nothing to fear. But yeah, it wasn't a spiritual family, so to say, but it wasn't a family that tamped down anything, so to say. We were allowed to find what resonated with us. If I all of a sudden wanted to have a certain belief, I doubt that my parents would have um, uh, squashed that or whatever. But I guess what it was is that I was allowed to be me, sort of so to say. Um, I didn't have to believe a specific way. I didn't have to uh, think a certain way. So that allowed a lot of freedom. Um, I don't, so as far as pre-birth planning, I don't necessarily resonate with that belief that I chose this particular family or I chose particular challenges. I really honestly believe that there's this gorgeous, beautiful energy of source energy and as soon as a child is born or an animal is born a dog a cat a deer a part of source cleaves off itself and then becomes the soul or the spirit to inhabit that being to enliven that being so i just simply believe that if there is any beautiful um planning that goes into it it would be from source but not from me so to say um so I don't know if that really answers that. I do definitely, and what I do believe though is because my mom is so much tapped into her intuition. She doesn't run around 
talking spiritually, so to say, and put that out there, but it doesn't scare her. Like when I, where I was talking to myself as a kid, it, she wasn't thinking, oh, we need to go take her somewhere and fix her kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, I think that was probably more what I meant, like being exposed uh -huh. to your mother's sort of clairvoyance <laughs> and then the stories that you shared about her being able to perceive dead people as well. Mm -hmm. And okay. so I'm curious, maybe if you want to share a little bit about what the process was like utilizing your gifts and turning them into a business, um, taking these spiritual experiences and finding that you're an evidential medium and then being able to help other people with that. Okay, that was a very interesting sort of long circuitous <laughs> road to get to simply because I always knew I wanted to make a difference in this world. I always knew I wanted to do, you know, positive work in this world. Um, so for many years, I worked in nonprofits. I worked for organizations helping Tibetans receive uh, political asylum. I worked for an organization where we would, uh, well, they would get interviews with Tibetans that were escaping from China over into uh, India, up over the Himalayas. Um, gosh, I've worked for organizations doing healthcare without harm. I'm just kind of trying to make the world a kinder, gentler place. And at a certain point, I got really burned out. Uh, one of the terminologies that I heard somebody use once upon a time was, uh, she said, I'm a recovering um, nonprofit worker. And at first, when I heard that, I thought, because I was still in the nonprofit world, I thought, well, that's awfully skeptical or pessimistic or whatever the word would be. But then after I was in it for a while, I realized, oh, gosh, I see what she means. Because oftentimes when you work for nonprofits, you end up living in or near big cities. But oftentimes you aren't paid very well. And it's really hard to live in or near those big cities. Plus, because I was reading a lot of stories about torture of Tibetans and just, you know, being kind of like the undercurrent of human behavior. At a certain point, I thought, oh my goodness, I can't do this work anymore. Not only do I not feel like I'm making a big difference, it's kind of pulling me down. So then I don't even remember how I came upon um, Reiki, but I started reading about it. And I thought without even having ever had a Reiki session, I thought, oh, that's gonna be my next path for a while. So I went and took the certifications, eventually worked my way up to what's considered Reiki master. I don't like that terminology just because the word master is in there, um, but I'm at that highest level of training for a Reiki practitioner. And then I immediately started volunteering my services. I volunteered with animal uh, rescue organizations. I volunteered with um, health conferences. I volunteered with um, hospice for four years. Uh, volunteering Reiki services to the clients on hospice. And I even um, had the beautiful fortune of getting to sit on the team that would sit in vigil with people as they were actively beginning to make their transition from this world to what comes next. Saw really gorgeous things transpiring there. And I immediately thought, oh, okay, so I'm home. I finally found my path. I really want to do this as a profession. Um, got a website built, just started offering my services. And then throughout the course of all of the years of doing that, I started recognizing, because that's been about 14 years now, I started recognizing, you know what, beings and spirit are all around me as I'm doing this work. And I really want to be able to bring forth what's being conveyed by these beings of spirit. So then I recognized, okay, well, that's mediumship work. So not only am I tapping into angels and guides and allies of the light that are surrounding these people that are utilizing my services, I'm tapping into their loved ones as well. And so, so then I thought, okay, well, if they're just coming to me just for the energy healing, they might not even be open to mediumship. So then I thought, okay, well, let's just go ahead and add that to my website then and start offering those services. And because I actually believe, and I'm not the first one to say this, philosophers throughout time have always said this, one of the biggest sort of wounds in the human psyche is the existential crisis of what is this, who am I, and what happens after this lifetime ends. And I believe that that leads to a lot of really self-destructive behaviors and patterns in people. So to me, one of the ultimate forms of energy healing are the mediumship readings because it really assures people we're not alone and life does continue. This physical life, has an ending to it. But for me, 
that is a release and that is a relief. I wouldn't want to be here in this physical form, in this physical realm for years on end. So to me, this is a very short portion of our spirit journey in general, of soul's journey in general. And then what comes next is, oh my goodness, like indescribably beautiful. And the reason why I call myself an evidential medium is because when I'm interacting with people, I will bring things through to them that their loved ones have said or have done, or even what's going on in their lives currently, the, the physical being that's my client, that they'll be like, oh my goodness, there is no doubt in my mind that you've connected with the being that that you're claiming to connect with. And that is so, so, so healing. That's beautiful. I, you know, I was thinking as, as you were talking before, I was thinking about the path to becoming a medium and we have so many gifted, talented, evidential mediums in our collective right now. And I feel like it's such a great tool for the grief journey too, almost more than anything else. Like, obviously this is exposing us to the idea that there's life beyond life, but even more than that, really helping the human experience to process that grief so that you actually still feel connected to your loved one. Such a beautiful gift to be able to offer the collective. Thank you for your service with that. I've really enjoyed talking with you today. I want to see if there's anything else that you'd like to share to feel more complete about our time together. I love that question. Um, I would say the main thing that I would want to share with everyone is the beautiful life is a gift. And in order to really appreciate that gift, share it with others actually truly step into that belief that we can be a healing presence in other people's lives simply by being present. No judgment, no advice giving, just simply be present. Um, let your light shine. Because one of the things we're taught, I think, oftentimes, especially as women, is, you know, minimize ourselves. Oh, is, you know, don't think too much of yourself. Um, that's conceited, or that is just any terminology one that you want to put there. But my belief really is the more that we truly integrate our physical self and our spiritual self and allow our light to shine, not only does that help others shine brighter, but then before you know it, all these other beautiful beings of light are just coming out of the ether and helping us. And that's in physical form as well as spiritual form. So really, truly live your light, shine brightly, be as happy as you can. And I don't mean like sugarcoat everything, but each and every day, just wake up with an attitude of gratitude, um, kind of go through what you're grateful for, what you're looking forward to. And one of the things that I always do in life or in each morning is I just ask my angels and my guides, what beauty can we co-create together today? Because this is a gift to be here. So I really want to share this gift with others and perhaps help them awaken even more to the fact that their life is a gift to not only me and others in this beautiful world, but ultimately to them and to source. Beautiful lens of perception to see the world through. Thank you so much for your gifts, your vulnerability, and your willingness to serve our community at IONS. Thank you so, so much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Betty.